Okay, so my name is Peter Vetter. I'm with uh, Alcatelus and Bell Labs, and I want to talk about uh, something very different from the previous speakers about fiber to the home. Three things that uh, you should take away from my presentation. First, fiber to the home based on passive optical networks is a very robust uh, broadband access uh, network. Second, you can make, uh, make it even more resilient. I will talk about a few resilient options that, that we have in such a technology. And third, it is an energy efficient solution and you can even make it more energy efficient and then improve on the uh, energy backup strategy, power uh, supply backup strategies. So uh, just to insult you, uh, but to make sure that everybody is on the same level, a passive optical network is a fiber infrastructure uh, where you share one line interface in the optical line termination at the central office by uh, a passive split, uh, sorry, a passive split uh, fiber network, and then you have to that one line interface 32 or even 64 um, subscribers connected via a optical network unit. The bandwidth on such a medium is a time division multiplexed scheme. So the, uh, you have a downstream in GPON, like in, in most FIOS installations of two and a half gigabit downstream and one and a quarter gigabit upstream. And uh, basically users are uh, selecting their relevant data based on packets and an address that is in the, those packets and those packets are broadcasted over that passive star. Key is here that it is a fully passive infrastructure. You can go over 10 miles without any active equipment and provide high uh, bit rates of tens or hundreds of megabits per subscriber. Uh, second, it's also a medium that is not as corrosive as uh, copper networks, and hence Verizon made the right choice to roll out the fiber and replace the, the copper infrastructure in damaged areas. Or also, if you uh, one day consider to combine that with utilities and put everything underground to be uh, more resilient, if you do the uh, civil work, work uh, well, fiber is, is, is the best medium of choice. It is also a very... Uh, power efficient broadband access technology. Thanks to the fact that you're sharing one line interface amongst multiple users, you're more efficient than uh, a, a point to point system with multiple interfaces for each subscriber or, or a, a copper equivalent. Now, since this is a workshop on resilience, I wanted to mention that, uh, well, the feeder <coughs> section, which is typically uh, a couple of miles long, is the most delicate part of your, your cable plant. The last drop behind the splitter is typically uh, hundreds of yards. So that's at, at, the, at the street corner, and then you, you go a block or two. So th that feeder section is your most delicate part, and you can actually implement feeder redundancy and let those redundant routes be terminated at the same central office. Or you can even <coughs> think of dual homing and having that redundant road to go to a, a second central office. Now, for residential users, you probably don't want to do that investment. Uh, you want to make it as cost uh, efficient as possible. But you could actually just have that route there and just unplug it uh, when, in a case of a disaster and plug the, the redundant route in. You don't need to engineer uh, highly sophisticated switchover protocols uh, that uh, reach the 50 milliseconds for residential users. In a case of a disaster, you're happy that you just have the route, and in a matter of, of an hour, you can unplug and, and replug to make it cost efficient. But in, in cases of business users or in case of mobile backhauling, you maybe want that fast uh, switchover, and, and there are protocols that, that take care of that, and you, you can do that in 50 or 100 milliseconds. You can go even a step further if you say, I, I'm not happy with just redundancy up to the splitter point. You can actually think of a topology that has full redundancy to, to every home uh, or, or every broadband uh, node that you want to supply. Uh, so you have a kind of a ring topology and uh, you, you try to have behind the splitter point, then you use the cable duct in a ring and you tap off the, the, the separate fibers. And then your redundant route, you do that in, in the opposite way. Again, behind the splitter point, you, you, ha you follow the duct and you, t you, you tap it off. And then the ultimate uh, redundancy, and that's maybe more for fiber to the business or fiber to the bank, is that you have even your op optical network unit at home uh, redundant. 
So this is one, one thing uh, about Pond. Then the other thing is its power efficiency and just comparing the different broadband access technologies. Uh, we, so first of all, you have ADSL that provides you uh, about a me megabit per second. So typically you have one watt per user in the central office in power consumption per subscriber. And at the home you have a CPE or customer premise equipment uh, that consumes about 10 watt per subscriber. If you want higher bandwidth, one approach is VDSL, and then you go to a remote node. At the remote node, VDSL typically has two watt per subscriber, uh, and at home you have again uh, a CPE that consumes about 10 watt per, per subscriber. Now think of that remote node. Uh, there's about 100 or 200 subscribers connected to that remote node, so you're there in the street with a unit that consumes 200 or, or more uh, watt. And then there is the alternative, uh, passive optical network, where thanks to the sharing of the interface in the central office, you consume less than half a watt per subscriber. Actually, with today's technologies, we are at 300 milliwatt per subscriber there, including actually air conditioning in the central office. Uh, and then you have a completely passive plant over 10 miles, and then you, you end up in the, the subscriber home, again, with an optical network unit order 10 watt per subscriber, depending on what services you want to provide. Now, you can make that optical network unit even more energy efficient. Uh, the standardization have already defined sleep modes. And basically the idea of sleep mode is you turn it off, uh, the ONU off when you don't need it. Um, now the, the, the question is always when you put something asleep, how do you know when to wake up when traffic is waiting for you? So and the, the way to, to do this is using uh, cyclic sleep cycles where you have short awake times where you can probe whether uh, traffic is waiting for you and then for a longer period you go back to sleep again. And then when traffic is waiting you can either have a simple implementation where you just stay awake or in a more sophisticated implementation you actually use those short awake times to burst data because you have a high speed medium of uh, 1 gig or even 10 gig gigabits per second and then just go to sleep and you can make these in, in optical network technologies, you can make these sleep cycles of 10 milliseconds or tens of milliseconds so that the delay time that this would introduce is not really uh, perceived in the quality of experience of, of human users. So that is one approach and we have implemented this and tested this and you can save about 50% in, in your optical network unit. But we also realized that this, the current standards were not designed with energy efficiency in mind. Um, if you have a closer look, so uh, remember you're broadcasting all the, the data to every ONU. Every ONU is analyzing that data. It is doing a synchronization, a descrambling, an error decoding, a deframing, and then it selects the relevant packets. Now just in the numerical example of 10 gigabit uh, on the medium aggregate, and then on an average, 10 megabit is what a user is, is, is looking at. Sometimes it's a bit higher for a fast download, but on the average video, that's 10 megabit. For voice, it's even less, it's, it's 100 kilobit. So actually, 99% of the data is unnecessarily processed. So we have been thinking, can we do this more efficient by rethinking the, the protocol as it is defined today? And in the Green Touch uh, Research Consortium, we came up with a new protocol, we called it Bit Interleaving Pond. And thanks to a different configuration of the information interleaved as bits, the relevant data can be selected much earlier, re really behind the receiver, behind the clock and data recovery. And so the subsequent processing is only done at the rate that is relevant to the user. So in the numerical example, 10 gigabit downstream aggregate rate, you're watching a video of 10 megabit per second, so the relevant bits would be spaced one in a thousand. So all the others are dropped and actually you don't even have to do queuing, you're just looking at the relevant bits at a, and, and doing the error decoding, the descrambling uh, at the rate of 10 megabit per second. So that gives significant uh, energy uh, savings. We've actually prototyped this uh, on the same platform as the standard protocol we were able to show that in the electronic processing for the MAC protocol with this new protocol, you can do more than a factor of 10 better in energy efficiency. And now, why does that matter in, in a workshop like this on uh, 
uh, resilience? Well, there is the uh, necessity in a power outage to uh, guarantee your service availability. And there's a number of things that you can do to improve the energy efficiency on your ONU. In, the, in an ONU, you have different functions like the MAC protocol, the electro-optical line termination, then your user interfaces, wh whether they are Wi-Fi, the gigabit Ethernet, or a voice interface, and then you also have some processor that takes care of the management of the whole uh, system. Now, one thing you can already do is power shedding. Functions that you are not really using, you turn them off. Another thing that you can do is that uh, cyclic sleep mode that I already explained, periodicity of 10 or a few tens of milliseconds, and combine that with that new protocol that gives you another factor of 10, well, then we, we get to power consumptions that uh, allow for alternative backup uh, power. So just comparing it, today's ONU is ordered 10 watt uh, for the total unit. You require a lead acid battery to guarantee you a service availability for the voice of eight hours. Now. With, that, uh, with those, a combination of those new technologies, you can get the standby mode down to less than what? 200 milliwatts, actually. The active uh, mode, for instance, when you have a voice call, is, is still only a watt. That means that you can run an active voice connection uh, for about eight hours on f four rechargeable uh, AA cells. Or you can run three days on a standby mode with those uh, four uh, rechargeable uh, double A cells. So thanks to new technologies, new energy efficient uh, methods, you can actually uh, th start thinking of new backup strategies in, in case of a, a power outage. And I realized today uh, that uh, voice is considered a lifeline, but more and more data is just as much a, a lifeline. Just as an add-on, you could also turn off that or power shed that voice interface and uh, use the gigabit ethernet interface and, and it, the the numbers match, you still have that eight hours of uh, service availability active use. Thank you.